the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, um, this morning we sang songs about praise him, praise him, and crown him with many crowns. Holy, 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 all hail the power of Jesus' name. I, I take all of these songs and I would put them in the category of anthems. Does anybody know what I mean by anthems? I, I mean an anthem is a song that a people lifts up uh, in devotion. And, and uh, so these are, these are anthems and they are worthy to be sung. There's other songs that we sing that are songs of encouragement, songs of challenge. And uh, we have quite of a variety even in our hymn book of the type of songs and how God uses them to minister to our hearts and how we bring praise to the Lord. But without apology, I'll tell you this morning, some of my favorite songs we sing are songs about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it, it's amazing to me that there is criticism of Christian churches singing songs about the blood and often here's the criticism by the unchurched that they are gory in nature to come together and sing songs about Jesus' blood that he shed. It's just, it just seems too gory for religion and for Christianity. These are, this criticism comes from some of the same people that are very involved in the video gaming industry and the entertainment industry. And the movie industry, where gore doesn't really seem to be a problem. And the more blood that's shed, the better. But when we're singing about the blood of Jesus, we're not trying to bring attention to gore. We're not trying to bring attention, as a matter of fact, to anything inappropriate. But actually what we're bringing attention to is a price that was demanded by God for sin that had to be paid and has to be paid, and that price is life. And the Bible says back in the book of Leviticus that the life of, a, of an individual, the life of a created being is in the blood. That, that your blood is, is more than just a liquid coursing through your veins, but that is your life. And as a matter of fact, everything that we learn scientifically about life ultimately comes, comes back to the blood that flows through our body. Our blood carries our DNA sequence and uh, repairs and, and rejuvenates organs and, and brings healing and things like that. When the blood gets sick, make no mistake about it, the body is sick. Because the Bible teaches that life is in the blood. And so when blood is shed, that's literally life spilling out of a person. And the blood that we sing about is not the blood of yours and I, uh, your blood and my blood. Because your blood and my blood has no special characteristics. Now I'm not saying our life isn't valuable. It is valuable to God. But what I'm saying is you and I just have tainted human blood that is cursed by sin. And yet it is still the price that God demands. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's a fact. Every one of us have, th have thought things, said things, or done things that displeased God or broke his laws. And because of that, God's demand is life. That's why he told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, he, he actually told Adam that, that you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And for the, for the, in the, the, the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Death is a consequence of sin, and it is the payment that has to be paid. Blood has to be shed. We see this echoed again not long after Adam and Eve in the garden when Abel brings his sacrifice to the Lord uh, for relationship with God and he brings of the firstlings of the flock and a, a sacrifice of shed blood. Now look, God wasn't satisfied with the blood that flowed out of a lamb or a firstling from the flock, but that was a picture 
That was just simply a picture of a lamb that God would send one day whose blood would be sufficient, whose blood would be enough. And I'm telling you, unlike the blood of any animal that was shed in the Old Testament as a picture, the blood that Jesus shed when he went to the cross of Calvary satisfied the demands of a holy God for, uh, for the sin that you and I have committed. And, and uh, we're going to look at some verses that talk about that. But, the, but when Paul says here in verse number 7, in whom, that means in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. What Paul's referring to is that the price has been paid. And God has accepted that payment so that my sin can be forgiven, so that I can be redeemed and reconciled in relationship back to a holy God once again. Now there's a lot of pictures of this blood sacrifice uh, throughout Old Testament history, and we're not going to look at all of those examples this morning. We talked about Abel's sacrifice that was more acceptable than Cain's because Cain's sacrifice that he brought didn't involve any blood. It was, it was fruit and vegetables and plants and things like that, but there was no shedding of blood in it, and therefore God did not accept it. Uh, we could fast forward to Abraham taking his only son Isaac uh, up on top of Mount Moriah, and he was going to offer him in obedience to God until God stopped him and told him not to do it. Do you know why God stopped him? God stopped him because God would not have been satisfied with that sacrifice, but God was satisfied with the obedience of his son Jesus who did shed his blood for our sins. And Isaac's obedience uh, and Abraham's were a picture of what God was going to do with his only begotten son. But when they nailed Jesus to that cross, there was no one in heaven who said, stop. And he went through with it. And Jesus gave his life on an old rugged cross for the sin of mankind. Where, where I want us to look at this morning is in Exodus chapter 12. And in Exodus chapter 12, God's people, Israel, are down in Egypt. And they're slaves down in Egypt and they've cried to God to be removed. And God's raised up a man from the backside of the desert, Moses, to go and say to Pharaoh, let my people go on behalf of God. And Moses has done that now many times. And every time that he does that, the answer has been no or yes, but no, I changed my mind and all of this kind of stuff. And so now they've, it's reached a place where God has manifested his power. They know that the true and living God is real. They know, that he, uh, they know what he's asking and they are still rejecting God. And God says, all right, this is going to have to be what we do uh, to, uh, in order for me to get my people out of Israel. So in Exodus chapter 12, the, the story takes up here with the Lord speaking to Moses and Aaron. And it says in verse number 1 of Exodus 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls, every man according to his uh, eating, shall uh, make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So here's what we've got so far. God says, this is, what's, this is what we're going to do here. Um, everybody in the congregation of Israel is going to uh, take a lamb out of your flock. Now remember, they were shepherd people. They were put in the land of Goshen, 
originally to keep sheep. So this is not uncommon that everybody has access to this. And so God says, I want you to take a, a lamb. It needs to be without blemish. It needs to be a male. It needs to be a firstling. Uh, and then I want you to take it and I want you to put it up. And keep it with you. In other words, you're going to treat this lamb different. It's, it's going to be special. And you're going you're gonna to keep it away from the others and set it apart for four days. From the 10th day of the month to the 14th day of the month, this is what you're going to do. And on the evening of the 14th day, then everybody in the congregation of Israel is going to uh, kill this lamb. And you're going to do it in the evening. Verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts... And on the upper doorpost of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. In other words, uh, this is, you ever heard somebody say, I hate to eat and run? Well, God said, this is what you're going to be ready to do. You're, you're, going, to be, you're going to be ready to head out the door here. And so he says... Uh, he says, uh, ye shall eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, if all of this sounds kind of strange to you, then let's uh, just kind of lay this to rest. This is not a common practice up until this point. There, there is something specific that God is doing here. And one more time... On the, walls of, on the walls of the history of the children of Israel, God is once again painting a picture that's for them and that's for us. And so what God does here is he says, take this lamb that you've set aside for these four days, kill it in the evening, take the blood and strike it. In other words, you're going to use some hyssop, which was like a, a leafy branch type thing, as like a brush and you're going to dip it in the blood of this lamb and you're going to strike it on the side post of the door and over the upper post of the door um, where, where it is set up there and then you're going to go in the house and you're going to cook this uh, lamb, you're going to roast it um, and then you're going to eat it and he says you're going to eat all of it. Now that's why he said if, uh, if your household is too small for one lamb, then combine with another household and, and number your people out to where you can consume this lamb. But then there's not going to be any waste. There's not going to be any left behind because if come to the morning the entire lamb is not eaten, you're going to burn the leftovers. There's no, there's no clamshells here. There's no to-go boxes for the journey here. You're going to burn the leftovers. You're going to burn the rest of the lamb and completely, uh, completely eliminate all that would be left. So then he says this, verse number 12. This is why you're going to do all of this. Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now let me pause right here and say, well, so at one point God's telling them just to have a very filling supper. And then the verse after that gets really dark and God says, I want you to do this because I'm going to kill every firstborn of man and animal in the land of Egypt. And with our sentimental nature, it's possible that we could read this and go, I don't understand that. I don't understand why God would do that. 
And just like we've kind of been talking about on Sunday nights with the land of Canaan and God's activity with the land of Canaan, once again in this situation, it, it might be a better question if we're thinking biblically and thinking rightly, why did God wait so long? Because God has now manifested His self, His power, His will in irrefutable ways, but there is a people who has chosen to reject this true and living God and hold on to their false gods with a false hope. And God is now brought to the place in its finality because after this, God's done. And God's brought to a place in his finality where he says that I've, I've sent my man to request. I've showed my power. I've done miracles. Beyond that, he brought plagues and then was gracious enough to remove the plagues. But now he says, they're still going to trust in these false gods and I'm left with no choice but to execute judgment on the false gods of Egypt. In other words, in a final showdown sort of way here, I will prove that I am God and they are not. So he finishes that statement with, I am the Lord. He didn't say, I am a God too. He didn't even say, I am a God. He said, I am the Lord. I am Jehovah, the God that is. But, verse number 13, and the blood, you remember the blood I'm talking about? The blood of that lamb that they struck on the doorposts and the, the upper post. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And he goes on to talk to the children of Israel about this, uh, about this feast. Verse number 21, if you wouldn't mind to uh, head down there with me. Verse number 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, basement, uh, basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance for thee and to thy sons forever. The Bible says in uh, verse number 28, And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead. There's been messages preached about it. There's been songs that have been written about this statement word for word that's found back in verse number 13. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless your word this morning and that you would have liberty to speak to us. 
And God, we do thank you for the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm thankful for your willingness to pay a price that we could not pay. And Lord, I'm thankful that you're satisfied with the sacrifice of your only begotten. And Father, I pray that, that you would truly strengthen hearts that need to be strengthened today and convict and challenge those that need it as well. And Lord, uh, have your way in our hearts and lives this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. What we have here in our reading this morning is a mention of the blood in both the New Testament and the Old Testament texts. I've already mentioned that the use of the blood in the Old Testament was a picture because the blood that was shed of animals was never a sufficient sacrifice that God would accept for the sin of mankind. It was only a picture of an ultimate sacrifice that would satisfy God. And yet God still, in the Old Testament religion, required it. There, if we were to read through the book of Leviticus this morning, we would find out there were rules that God gave about the blood and how the blood would be sprinkled and applied. There was a whole day of atonement that was part of a feast. Uh, that was given once a year where the high priest would offer sacrifice and sprinkle blood. And according to God's word, what this would do for the nation of Israel is that it would take all of their sins that had been committed in that previous year and it would roll all of those sins forward uh, to the next year where there would have to be another sacrifice that was made and more blood uh, of, a, of an animal would have to be spilled and would have to be applied. And all this would lead up until one day when God's forerunner, what do I mean by forerunner? I mean one who comes ahead of and announces or heralds. God's forerunner of the Savior, Jesus Christ, John the Baptist was down at the River Jordan and he was baptizing and he said maybe some of the most profound words that have been uttered by a prophet of God for the gospel's sake when he says, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Man, there's a lot in that statement. Number one, he says, Behold, this is significant because up until this time, no one had ever been able to actually physically see the Lamb of God that would make sin right with God. No one had ever been able to look upon him, but that day when John the Baptist said, Behold, it's because he was looking right at him. He was looking him right in the eye. Uh, John the Baptist was about six months older than Jesus and he's out there and he's, he's preaching that people need to repent and put their faith in God for salvation. And he's baptizing people according to this message of repentance. And he looks up and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. Now he says, Behold, because he's literally seeing him. And he says the Lamb of God because this would take any Jewish person in their mind back to the scripture of a practice that they had been familiar with year after year after year. But something was different about this lamb. This was not a sheep. This was not, uh, this was not a, a livestock. This was not an animal. The one he pointed at was a human being. He was a man about 30 years old. And he stood there on the bank of that Jordan River. And this now was the Lamb of God. So he says, wait a minute, we're, we're used to this Lamb of God thing. We're used to this Lamb that's set apart and designated as an offering unto the Lord for the atonement of our sins. But now John, the prophet of God, is pointing to a man and calling him the Lamb of God. And he won't just roll our sins forward for another year, but this is different. He's come to take them away. He's come to do away with them completely and entirely. The Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament uh, children of Israel were familiar with this concept 
of God demands death for sin. And so according to God's purpose and his plan and the religion that he set forth in the Old Testament, part of this plan was sacrifice. Part of this plan was substitutionary death. That's what every animal sacrifice was. It wasn't that, hey, God wants this animal or God wants it to die. No, it wasn't that. Anyone who came to offer a sacrifice should have had the understanding that I'm asking God to accept the death of this creature in place of this creature. And God was willing to do that for a time. Because the idea was not that the sacrifice saved, but the faith in a sacrifice not yet made would one day not just roll sin forward, but take it away. I've said it like this before. I'll say it again because I believe it's true. Salvation has always been and always will be by grace, through faith, in the work of Jesus Christ. I believe that with all my heart. Well, what about in the Old Testament when they did this, this, and this? Salvation has always been by grace, through faith, in the work of Jesus Christ. One preacher said it like this. He said, in the Old Testament, they were trusting in a coming Messiah who would do what Jesus did. In other words, their faith leaned on the cross before it happened. You and I are no different other than this. Our faith leans on what Jesus did on that cross, and it has already happened. But salvation has always been about the sacrifice of God's own self on that cross of Calvary. It's the way it's always been. All of, the, all of the Old Testament animal sacrifices were just a type, a picture of the blood that would be shed not to push sin forward, but to take it away. So John says, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Do you realize that John the Baptist is referring that day to the Passover? He's referring to Exodus chapter 12, that lamb that had to be set aside. And by the way, Jesus was set aside. He was separate. Yes, he came to live as a man, but he wasn't like us. He was holy. He was sinless. He was without spot. He was without blemish. Not one man, not one woman, not one boy or girl who's ever lived can say that about themselves. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But not Jesus. He came as a man because the price that had to be paid was death. And human death. So he became his own creation. He became a man so that he could sacrifice himself. But because his death was not the consequence of any sin he had done, God accepted his death as a substitute for all of mankind. He accepted the blood that Jesus shed as the paid price for all sin. Can you think about this with me this morning? Uh, and, and church members, you've heard me say this, but there's some guests with us this morning. You, you need to understand this. This is why faith in Christ for salvation is different than every other religion of the world. And here it is. In almost every other religion of the world, the gods or deities that are being worshipped demand sacrifice for worship for relationship from their worshipers, from their adherents. Only the true and living God became his own sacrifice for those that would worship him. Only the true and living God. He doesn't demand a sacrifice from you. He is the sacrifice. 
He gave the sacrifice. He shed his blood. And, and, and here in the Old Testament, there's this picture where this set-apart lamb, his life was taken, his blood was shed. But here, here's the important part. That blood couldn't just be shed. It had to be applied personally and individually. And I'm not talking about individually like every member, but every household. Every household. They had to, this is what Moses said. Moses said, don't go out that door. Moses said, you put that blood on the door and you don't go out that door. You stay in that house. Why? Because God's coming by. And he's looking. He's looking. What's he looking for? What's going to make the difference in how God interacts with the inhabitants of that house. What's he looking for? Well, I guess he's looking to see if they're sinners or not. I think he already knows everybody in every house is a sinner. That's not... Look, whether the house is filled with sinners or not is not going to affect how God interacts with that household. That's not what he's looking for. He's looking for one thing. The blood. He's looking to see whether the blood has been applied. I don't know if this happened, but I, I just kind of know humanity a little bit, and so I wonder. You okay if I preach something, I wonder for a second? I just wonder if maybe some of the children of Israel heard Moses' words and might have just thought, this sounds stupid. I don't see how this is going to do anything. I don't see why this is important. So we kill a lamb, we take its blood, we take hyssop and we paint it on the door frame and then we go inside and we don't come out till morning and everything in our house is going to be okay. That sounds silly. I don't see why that's a thing. Now, now look, I'm not saying that happened. I just kind of know humanity a little bit because I are one. And I know that there might have been some who just thought, maybe a fleeting thought, maybe they dwelled on it for a while. I don't see the significance of this. I don't see the importance of this. Here's what I want you to understand. If you're going to do this, what God said, and, and take, this, take the life of this lamb, apply the blood, you're just going to have to trust that it has significance. You're going to have to trust that that is in fact what God's looking for and how he's going to make his decision. Can I, can I say it this way? This is an act of faith where you're believing that God has spoken through the servant Moses, that Moses is telling you what God said, and that doing what God said is going to make the difference of whether you wake up in the morning and leave your house victorious, full of joy, or you wake up in the morning with great bitterness of soul because of the loss that you've experienced. Anybody with me on this? You're going to have to determine if God's telling you the truth or not. You're going to have to tell you if God's means of communication is accurate or not. You're going to have to, you're going to have to trust and obey in this situation. So God said, here's what you got to do. I know that God is looking for the blood because that's exactly what he said. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And I've got to tell you, that that is a wonderful picture of the salvation that is communicated all throughout the New Testament and that is still being preached today, that what is going to make the difference as an individual of how God interacts with you in judgment is not whether or not you're a sinner. He already knows you are. 
It's not how good of a person you are. Your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You have nothing good on your own that you can offer to God and say, God, take a look at this. Does this make a difference? It doesn't. I'm just telling you it doesn't. When it comes to how God deals with you in judgment of sin, he's looking for one thing. And it's this. Has the blood been applied to your life? Are you washed in the blood? Now, if you know anything about blood, you would know that that's, a, that's an odd question in and of itself. Nobody washes in blood. Blood stains. Blood doesn't cleanse. Blood makes dirty. So what do you mean, are you washed in the blood? No, you have to understand what God said. God said that by faith in him and his plan of salvation, though your sins be as scarlet, kind of like blood, they shall be white as snow. His blood cleanses. His blood washes. His blood covers. His blood removes. You want to talk about a powerful cleaning agent? How about the blood of Jesus Christ? Because what it has to clean is pretty dirty. What it has to clean is pretty ugly. What, he, what it has to, to, to clean is pretty stained. And it's a set-in stain. What, what his blood has to clean is pretty wicked, pretty dark. And yet, would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Now, now, come on, you see why we sing these songs? Because this is important stuff. He, he, didn't, he didn't go to Calvary and die just to be an example of sacrificial love, although it was the greatest example of sacrificial love that's ever been shown. He didn't go to just be a good example of that. No, the shedding of his blood was essential. It was absolutely necessary if our sins were going to be forgiven. See, somebody might say, Preacher, doesn't the Bible say that God loves the world? And I'm happy to tell you, it does. And not just in one place, again and again and again. I mean, probably most people in here know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. It's pretty plain. Well, doesn't it also say that everybody that makes up the world are sinners? Yeah. Well, isn't sin, preacher, against God? Sure is. So then doesn't God hate sinners and therefore hate the world? Listen carefully. God does hate sin. He hates sin because of its death, its destruction, its consequences. He hates sin because it violates his character and his person. No, God hates sin, but God loves sinners. God commendeth, that word means shows, his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That, that blood price had to be paid. Hebrews, Hebrews 9 and 10 says that all of the blood of bulls and goats never satisfied the demand of God. But then Jesus came. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. And when Jesus went to Calvary and died and shed his blood, the blood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins was not just any blood. It was holy blood. It was perfect blood. It was righteous blood. And when Jesus shed his righteous blood, while, oh, this is so important, while bearing in his body your sins and my sins, 
He did that. Well, how? I can't explain it. We'll ask one day. How about that? But I know he did. He took all sin of all mankind of all time in his own body, bore it to Calvary, and when his righteous blood flowed from his veins and he gave up the ghost and he died, God counted his death as the paid price for all sin of all mankind of all time. That means yours. That means mine. You say, all right then. Hallelujah. I'm saved. Tell me out just a second. The blood paid the price. But it's got to be applied. I, l- listen carefully. The death of Jesus Christ was sufficient to pay for the sin of all mankind. But the death of Jesus Christ is only efficient to those who trust him and call upon him for salvation. Those who acknowledge, God, I'm a sinner. You had to die for my sin. The price had to be paid for my sin. And Lord, I believe that the blood that Jesus shed was for me. And you know what that means? Well, you got to... Come to church, get baptized, do a bunch of good works, and then ask him if he'll apply his blood to your life. Now, if you're visiting today and you're seeing people do like this around you right now, it's because they know, I'm just trying to get your attention. There is nothing in the Bible about that. Here's what the Bible says needs to be done in order for the blood to be applied. It is a free gift. All that's required on your part is acceptance. That's it. And and I can stand on good ground to preach that to you. He came unto his own and his own received him not, but to as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believed on his name. When a person acknowledges I'm a sinner and my sins have offended God and there's a price that is owed and that price is my death. My blood has to be shed and I have to die because of my sin. But wait a minute. I've heard some good news. I've heard the gospel. I've heard this message that God loved me so much that Jesus came took all my sin in his own body, went to Calvary, shed his blood in my place, and that God has accepted his death as a substitution for mine. God, I receive that. Boom. Saved. Just like that. Well, I got things in my life that need to be changed. We all do. But that's not whether or not the blood covers your sin and wipes it away in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to how well we do this or what ceremony we go through here. No, according to the riches of his grace. Unmerited favor. Like paying a debt he did not owe. And a debt we could not pay. So... Jesus' blood is accepted by God. In Isaiah chapter 53, the Bible talks about the faithful servant. It's a prophetic chapter about the coming Jesus Christ. And it says something that, to be honest with you, it's hard for me to read. When it says this, yet it pleased God to bruise him. In other words... God takes responsibility for judging his son to the point of causing his blood to flow. You say, God takes responsibility for doing that to his son? Yep, he does. And not only does he take responsibility for it, the Bible says that it pleased him to do it. 
You know why? Because the fact that he shed the blood of his only begotten son as a sacrifice for our sin and was satisfied means that all who put their trust in Jesus Christ, God doesn't have to judge them. Their judgment's already been taken care of. Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, there is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of His grace. Why? Because there was a Savior who was willing to come and live among us and be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and ultimately crucified and hung on a cross and die. But that's okay because three days later he rose up from that grave showing that death could not hold him, that he was more powerful than the sentence of death that was upon his life. And he rose again with the keys of death, hell, and the grave in his hand. And he's seated at the right hand of God right now. And anyone who admits they're a sinner and calls on Jesus for salvation, this is what he promised, that he will in no wise cast them out. He has no reason to. There's nobody that's ever accepted his free gift and all of a sudden he's pulled it back and said, no, wait a minute. That's not why Jesus died. Jesus died to put that free gift out there and for you to say, I'm not worthy, but I'll take that. Y your life for mine? I'll accept that. Um, when a person does that, according to God's word, his blood cleanses them. So that when God, in the day of judgment, sees the blood of his son applied, that's a Passover right there. Already judged. My son took it for him. No, no, no. You need to, you need to know this. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. And in that day, you don't want to just stand before God with nothing but excuses. Because Romans 1 says we are without excuse. But you can stand there with the blood applied. And that makes all the difference. Because what he's still looking for to this very day is the blood. The blood of his son that allows him to pass over us in judgment. Because Jesus already took it on your behalf and my behalf. Maybe there's somebody this morning that just needs to accept that free gift of a blood that was shed. Say, preacher, I'm a sinner and I, I need his blood applied to my life. I believe he died for me, rose again from the dead, is alive today, and I want him to be my savior. He'll forgive you. And he'll save you. He'll give you new life. Because he promised he would. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless this invitation time. Lord, if you've spoken to a heart, Lord, that needs to just simply reach out and accept the free gift of life eternal. The free gift of forgiveness through the blood of Jesus today. Then Lord, by believing in their heart that Jesus Christ died for them and rose again. And confessing with their mouth, Lord, I pray that they would call upon him for salvation. Lord, thank you for being willing to save us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being willing to forgive us of all of our sin. And God, now I, I pray for those who are listening, Lord, that you would just give courage to make a decision for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? We're gonna...